Right, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us again tonight, especially after uh, the severe technical issue issues that we had on Saturday. We've got Paul Warren joining us very shortly, but typically uh, something else has gone wrong and he's got a flat tyre at the minute. So he's literally just walking through the door as we speak. Um, we'll start off with questions for uh, Richie and, and Hammy, if that's OK. As I said, the format of this is just going to be to fire questions into the um, YouTube comments and we'll, we'll get through as many as we can. Uh, but before we get started, I just want to say a big thanks to Warney, Richie and Hammy for taking the time out to join us. Uh, just make it clear when you are putting your um, comments in the YouTube just to say who the question's for and uh, that way we can direct it to the, uh, to the right place. But for now, thank you and uh, we'll kick off. So let's find one that is for Richie or Hammy. Richie, one for you. Um, yep. Oh, Mad says, obviously, every player has come on leaps and bounds throughout this season. Who do you think has improved the most this year, in your opinion? Um, I, I think probably one of the first ones would be Matt Alessandri, uh, bearing in mind that he hadn't played one league game when he walked through the door. Um, only been playing under 23s football. Um, wasn't, wasn't in his own mind, really. Uh, wasn't really thinking about playing 20, 30 games uh, for the first team. I think he, even in his, by his own admission, was probably expecting to play the odd game, dipping in and out, playing the odd cup game. So uh, I think he's probably one of the um, the main improvers in terms of from the start of the season. And then I think obviously uh, from Chio coming in, uh, Obviously, uh, and having that injury issue, but I think Chio's improved immensely just in terms of game understanding. The physical aspects were there, obviously, in terms of his pace, but his game understanding of what to do in and out of possession um, have improved um, dramatically. So I think for two younger players uh, who are relatively new to us this season, I would say probably Chio and probably Matt on Sunday, I think. We'll just skip past a few warning questions that are in there. He is just uh, taking a seat in the press room. We'll... This one's for, for all of you, but just for both of you for now. Good question from Kate. He says, if you had to change places with one of the current players, who would you swap places with and why? Oh, wow. Uh, do you want to no go first, Danny? <laughs> yeah, I'll start, I'll start with Ben Wiles because he's from exactly the same place as I was from. So I'm going back to my roots, aren't we? So it's a bit of a no-brainer for me, really, isn't it? That way then I can get back in jockey and everything. And um, like Wiles, he does every Friday night, I think. Um, I think I'd probably go I'd probably go Michael Ickwe I think just because uh, I think it's a really interesting and pivotal time for him moving forward in his career now um, with an opportunity to play championship football he's now proved himself at, at League One level and I think it's a real good opportunity for him now to push his career on and interesting to see how he copes if, if selected obviously playing regular championship football one I'd, of go Matt I'd go Matt Brooks. I'd go Big, thick hair. I've always wanted to know what it feels like to be over five foot tall and to be able to score. So I would go Matt Brooks. Notice how to you two former strikers didn't pick Michael Smith. Do you make him do much, too much running? I've seen the state of Smithy's ankles and that. They get, he gets kicked to death. I don't want that. Understandable. Um, Kev Johnson says, for you, Warney, what are the chances of Newcastle letting us down, have Dan Barlasser back next season, seeing as they have billions now? <laughs> uh, well, I don't know if the owners have, uh, if they've done, actually gone through that deal. So I don't know. I know that um, Dan, understandably, uh, it's his boyhood dream to play for Newcastle. So that will be his first intention. Um, and if that doesn't look feasible, then, you know, uh, I think he'd love to come back and play and Hopefully that's the case. But in fairness, from our point of view, we want what's right for Dan. And if it's to play for Newcastle, then good luck to him. And I said to him, I'll buy a ticket. I ain't bought a football ticket for about 30 years. So I'd drive up the road and watch him play. And it would be, you know, be great for all of us because everyone on this screen's had an input in him. So and he's one amazing kid. So I hope he gets the dream. But if he doesn't, he'll come back to us. Just to elaborate on the Dan question, I know when he first came in, uh, he perhaps wasn't flavour of the month with the fans, but you guys always trusted that he was going to come good and he had that patience and now people will be talking about him as one of the players of the season, I imagine. Yeah, it's odd, isn't it? It's odd um, um, fans are like that with a lot of people, to be fair. Strange, isn't it? I mean, we get a lot of things wrong, I appreciate, but um, 
we we see him on a so it's all right for us though, isn't it? We pick the team for Saturday. We see him all week. We see him train. We see how the opposition play. We've watched the opposition play. And sometimes, you know, uh, and that's the hardest thing for us. We have a lot of players turn around every summer. Um, and it's difficult. It doesn't hit the ground running all the time. I think all our seasons, we, um, we've always been good from Christmas onwards um, because lads get used to it. They get a little bit stronger. They, Rich and Amy put a lot of information into them. So it takes a bit longer um, to get them going. It was like that with Dan, really. Dan um, started not bad, to be fair, but the way we were playing with the 4-3-3, um, Possibly didn't suit as much, possibly, but it does take a little bit of settling in time. So if there's any players that join us in the summer and there's fans watching me talking here, please give them the benefit of the doubt. Let them have a few games because, you know, get get behind the players because it helps massively. And you could see how what we all saw in Dan as the season progressed. So um, Dan was one of our uh, shining lights, that is for sure. Uh, Reese Kellex asked a question that was be uh, it'll be considerably easier to answer this season than last season. Um, my question to all three: Which has been your favourite away game this season, and why? Who wants to go first? Amy, do you want to go first? I don't mind going first. Um, my favourite away game was Ipswich Town, purely because of performance. Really, um, I think we'd had a bit of a bad run leading up to it. Um, and I think we all believe that we're a lot better than what we are. And that kind of night reassured us a little bit more, really, if that makes sense. I think we we, we, we knew, we, we thought we had a good team, but for some reason things weren't clicking. But for that, on that night, um, I think we dom dominated, arguably. I think they were right up there at that point. And I think we absolutely dominated, but it could have been a lot more. So that, that was probably the favourite one for me. Rich, what about yourself? Um, I mean, that was a good choice from Amy, but I'd probably go Oxford because I think at the time, mm -hmm. Oxford were arguably, um, I think actually they were favourites to win the league that morning or something like that. So the fact that we were 3-0 up at half-time against arguably one of the best teams, I don't think, had they not got beat at home or something and they'd only conceded six goals at home or something stupid and we scored three and a half. So um, I thought, considering that we started the game with, I think, Matt on Sunday at left back and Wilesy at right back or something. So, um, to, to go to possibly the league favourites at that particular time and be 3-0 up at half-time. Uh, so, I, I would say Oxford, I think. I think the, the first half performance was was brilliant. And now I'll add to that, sorry, before Gaffer speaks. But also, he won't say it, but we'll both say it. Obviously, because of reasons we're rich that night. I mean... I've never walked off a pitch crying and I remember like going up to him and little tears were coming down. So for an emotional reason as well, it's got to be that one. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that was important. And thanks to everybody who turned up. Morning. Well, I would have definitely said Oxford if it weren't for Rich um, saying it. So I won't nick that. But that was the best 45 minutes I've ever seen from a team away from home, ever. Playing, watching on telly, whatever. I just thought we were unbelievable. Crooksy and Chio and Vass were different gravy. And obviously the way it ended with uh, Rich and all that was just uh, gives you hope in the club you work for, really. Um, so I like that the most. However, I've got a couple of crackers. I love, um, I really enjoyed Smudge's um, goal at Shrewsbury uh, on Boxing Day, I think it was. Um, I remember looking at my wife during the game behind the dugout and she looked like, she was going to poo a kidney. And then in the end, she was at his all happy day. So that was good. Um, so I enjoyed that. I really enjoyed the Lincoln game, actually, because at the time we were having a bit of a uh, bit of momentum and people started really believing in us. And uh, Vass is uh, balling for Crooksy. And the fact it was for Crooksy's friend meant a lot. So I really enjoyed that one. But if I'm honest, the one with the biggest thump it up was Aki away. When Wiles, he um, somehow fluffed the back of his head and it went in the bottom corner. And we were right like in line with it. And it just, that was surreal. The fact that they nearly scored 10 seconds later, we don't discuss. But uh, so that was, that was right up there. And then uh, it was heartbreaking, the fact that we lost one of our supporters there. But it was, uh, it really felt when we came away from there um, that we were going to have, a, you know, finish with an amazing season. And the lads all just had real belief, considering how bad the conditions were first half. So uh, I've given you 17 answers there. So take whichever one you like. But I'll, I'll probably go, because I don't give Wiles enough credit, I'll go uh, the young Matt Hamshaw's winner at Aki. 
a question from Dale. Uh, he says sort of to all really. So just just one of you go for this one. Was there a time in the season as a defining moment, whether it was on the training ground or in a game, where you thought, right, we've got a chance of getting promoted here? When when was it you sort of knew you were you going to be right in the mix? I know obviously that was the intention at the start of the year before you kicked the ball, but was there a, a game or defining moment, shall we say? I think for me and Richard, we went sesh, uh, Gaffer um, shortened his finishing session to 35 minutes one Friday afternoon. Usually he keeps strikers out there for two and a half hours. And finally, me and Richie, after three years, thought we have cracked it. But we didn't, because following Friday, he upped it again. Um, but I'll let one of you two add to that. I just thought I'd put a bit of comedy well, in there. Mine, just very briefly, I think is probably, I know it's been mentioned, Smudge's goal at Shrewsbury. I think uh, that, that you have to look at the run that we went on after that. And I think that sometimes, just sometimes one goal can mean a little bit more than the couple of points that it got. So for me, I think it's probably Boxing Day. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll move on to the next one from Oliver. And uh, he's one for you, one. He says, which areas do you, do you believe need strengthening this summer? Obviously, you're not really sure what the picture is going to look like at this moment in time. We're a fair way away from getting going again. But where do you think needs strengthening? And do you have a formation in mind that you tend to, intend to use next season? Um, the other two are laughing at me. I can see them in the corner of my eye. Uh, yeah, I'm going for a um, uh, red hour formation. It's really like get it up the other end and everybody run. Get up there and then you lose it, everybody back. So we will probably go, our intention, because obviously you'd be surprised to know we discussed this. Um, our intention really is to play 4-4-2 if we can, but it would be naive to, of us to think that we could possibly go to, I don't know, Fulham or Watford on a Tuesday night and play 4-4-2. We might, we might not. We might play a variation of that and have a, a sitter, uh, and one up top, or we might even play like a four-two-three-one uh, with two sitters, and the uh, the three in front have the license to go. So we've got three real systems. I think what I think we've got a dearth of is uh, winging options. Really, I still think we need um, one or two left wingers. I still think we need competition and backup for Chio. Um, so they're my major points. Up top, we're okay. But we've also also got to be aware of the fact if we lose someone, so, excuse me, uh, possibly, you know, one of our stars might go, might not, but might go. So we always have to be prepared for that. So really, I think it's out wide. Bit of an issue in goalkeeper. Middle of the park, we're pretty good. We need probably one. Everyone loves a striker, don't they? Uh, but defensively, we're not, we're not too bad, really. Probably another fullback cover. Um, but we love a utility player. So anyone who can play left back and left wing would be a result. But we're just trying to really get pace and athleticism. Um, we want to be like, we set out, it's a good uh, text message, sorry. We set out at the start last season, like the coaches give the lads what we want to do. And one of them was to be the best at set pieces. And I think we were, so we'll still want to be that. I'm going to put the gauntlet down to him. And I have, I've texted half the team already saying I want them to be the fittest team next year which is some are asking the championship because they are real athletes. So um, I hope some of the lads are watching this because they, they're going to get absolutely brutalised this summer. So we'll look forward to that and we'll try and assign players that fit our mould and our system and lads who want to come here and think this is the best club they've been at. They're the sort of players that we want and they're the ones that history suggests over the last few years that we've got the best out of. So I hope that answers the question. Staying on the same theme, I think you're up again, Warney. Um, question from Chris Hercock says, when will the retain list be going out? Um, I know it's something you're well on with. And what's the sort of situation with uh, with Jerry Yates? Um, well, the retain list, there isn't many uh, not on it, really, because there's hardly anyone out of contract. And I'm having conversations with all of them players, so I'll keep that in-house before I announce that. That will probably be later in the week. What's happening with Jerry is that he's just gaining, um, understandably, because we always thought the world of Jerry, um, especially when he scored the winner against Norwich. I'll never forget that. But um, he's getting loads of attention from loads of clubs, as I would expect him to, because goal scorers get that. So, and that will that will continue throughout the summer. If if there's a if there's a deal that we think suits us and him, and everyone's happy, then it might happen. If not, he's he's our player. So there's nothing too exciting to tell you there, apart from possibly what you see. On the internet, there are definitely clubs in League One who will take him, and why wouldn't they? He's a brilliant player. So, you know, but he signed an extension deal here, and until someone tells me differently, he's my player. 
And I suppose the final part of the question, and it's for you guys, obviously, knowing how close, because to the outside world, we're not sure what's going on with the football world, but how close to signing players are we? Is that something you think might be a, a longer process this year? Obviously, the championship season's got to finish just yet. So how so does the recruitment situation look? Can I just answer that quickly? And then I'll let Rich answer it because I bet he's got something to say as well. Like, everyone keeps telling me there's 14, 1,600 players out of contract um, being released. That is true. A lot of them will be League One and League Two players. I don't mean this disrespectfully, but players getting released from League One and League Two may, may not help us in the championship. So already you can cut that number down considerably. Players who have been playing in the championship and Premier League who are being released, who have been on 25, 30 grand a week, I don't think suits our culture. I might be wrong and I'll, we'll meet them as best we can. So it isn't like there's all these players out there and there's loads of bargains to be had. I think we'll, we'll definitely try and get one or two in before we come in back on July the 1st. But then it's a little bit of a waiting game because players are still playing until the end of July. So it might be the fact this year, if we start back end of August, we might not even have our full, um, uh, full squad together. And that's just the way it is. We might have better players the longer we wait. And I think loads of clubs will be playing the waiting game this year, this season, and we'll be one of them. But if we can nail down a loan here or there, then uh, we will try to. But I don't think we have to be as hasty. Sorry, Rich. No, just briefly for me, is that um, I don't think anybody really knows how it's going to... I don't even know if it's been confirmed when the window is going to close yet. So the window may go on till maybe October or something. So... I think, um, and, and, and the gap is right there in that people keep talking about this one and a half thousand players that are out of contract. I've spoken to at least two managers who've only got six players on the contract. So, you know, if you do the maths quite simply, you know, some of those players are obviously going to get clubs because they have to be replaced. So, um, but I, I think uh, the ones who probably wait the longest might be the ones who get the better deals from a football club point of view because, um, you know, we may end up getting somebody in September that we probably didn't think we were going to get now. So, um, and we've got still got plenty of players on the contract anyway. So I don't think that's a, much of an issue. Uh, this one looks like a, an open forum one from Paul. Uh, hi, looking at the club sat at the bottom of the championship, all went up last year. What will we do differently clear, as clearly the gap in standard is getting wider, which I assume is between the championship and League One. Um, I know you'll have learned a few lessons from last time we were in there. Is there anything you've or do you mark to do differently this time around? I mean, um, well, look, we we have a we have a specific way of playing, and I, I think like it's important like about the recruitment. We've obviously Rob Scott's come in and and, and done really well so far with recruitment. We've had a lot um, a lot closer eye on it, should I say, due to circumstance um, this summer. So we we've been watching tons of games everywhere. Um, so, like, for us to, to bridge that gap, we believe that we need to be, like the gaffers just touched upon, the fittest team, the most athletic team, and the most organised team. And I think you saw a team last time we were in championship that out of possession were definitely one of the most organised. I think in possession, at times, we struggled for that little bit of quality, which you pay for at that level. I think that's the difference. You, you think of some of the chances we've arguably missed this year. And it's down to us as coaches to try and make lads better that when them chances come, they take them. Um, but we feel that we're... we're um, it, look, it's always going to be a, a tough task to stay in that division. There's, there's clubs... I'm not too sure that clubs um, will curb the spending, if I'm going to be honest. I think they'll still be spending a hell of a lot of money to try and get back into Premier League. But I certainly think that um, with right recruitment and certainly some of the lessons we learned last time, um, we should... Touch wood, fingers crossed, being a much better place this time. To um, and, and I think players believe it a lot more this year. I think that um, players are really excited for it. They've got confidence for it. They've also had experience of playing there, so it, it shouldn't phase them as much as arguably it might have done last time. But we've still got players, as Richard touched upon earlier about Matt Sunday Sundays, his first season in League One, let alone in Championship. Now, we'd like to think that he's going to spread his wings and, and be unbelievable for us. Um, and he's got certainly got capable abilities of doing that, but so have other players. So we'd like we'd like to think that um, come championship start, whenever that may be, we're, we're all ready for it and really confident that we can achieve something. This is the the million dollar question, and I think you'd appreciate if someone had the answer to this for you. Actually, I'll, I'll give it to you. One, it's from Come On You Reds, nineteen ninety eight. Says 
how do you keep all our strikers happy next season, especially when there'll be times when we're playing one up top, I assume? I mean, it's, it's the same across the pitch, but you know, it's one of your least favourite parts of the job. Yeah, yeah. It's difficult keeping the strikers happy because in fairness, uh, apart from me and Rich, strikers have the biggest egos. So, uh, and they need to, they need to be uber confident. They need to think they're going to score no matter what. So their biggest character strength makes them a great player, but also makes them more difficult to manage because they want to play every week, which I understand completely. Look, the players that succeed here, be it left back, centre forwards, goalkeepers, are the ones who get it. And we make no excuses. Every player we sign, we virtually talk them out of signing, saying, look, we pick the team to try and win a game. It's not personal and it, it is about it is about everyone. It's not about, you know, so I, we say it all the time and everyone says it now, but it's about the we and not the me. But it is difficult. I won't disagree. And sometimes, you know, for example, if we played at home on a Saturday and Vass and Smudge played up front and Vass scored, but then Tuesday night we're away at Middlesbrough, let's just say, and we think that game isn't going to suit the way Vass plays. And, it's you know, I have to pull him in on a Monday and say, look, Vass, you're not playing tomorrow. And he'd be like, look, I've just scored. We just won. Why, why on earth would you change it? But tactically... It makes sense to play this way. And unfortunately, you know, as the coaches, we make the decisions, we give out the bad news and you've got 22 players. You can only keep 11 happy. So it isn't an easy ask. I, I completely agree. And the good thing about having three strikers and if we bring another one in is that they all push each other. Like in fairness, I think like Smudge was unbelievable in the championship. He's had another great season this year, but that's as much down to the fact that Freddie and Vass have been pushing him and vice versa. Freddie's had an unbelievable season as when Vass has played, we've been brilliant. So they all push each other on. They all want to play, you know, as did I, as did Hammy, as did Rich. But, you know, all you can do is be honest with them and say, this is the reason why we're playing. They might not like it. And sometimes it might just be, you know, we us coaches could be divided. And sometimes it's just a hunch. Just go with a hunch and think, look, I just feel that today this game's going to suit Freddie or this game's going to suit Vass. But it is, a, it is a very difficult part of the job. And any manager or coach will tell you the same. Well, coaches won't because they'll say, yeah, you're right, Bass. Yeah, yeah the gaffer, yeah, just go and see him down there and uh, I'll go and have a coffee. So, uh, and Rich has been a manager, so he definitely knows what I'm talking about. So, um, so, yeah, so it's difficult for everyone. Trying to keep your best players happy all the time, very difficult because we don't really carry squad players here. Everyone can play in the first 11, which is great. And they're all very competitive, but it comes with, you know, difficulties so there's a few people asking questions around a certain individual um, from Scotland but we'll not talk about individual players obviously contracted to other people in a minute so we'll spin that question a little bit and say sort of you know you've got Jamie Lindsay out of the Scottish leagues I assume Scotland's somewhere you're looking again potentially and, and maybe further afield is that is that the case Richard um, yeah, well, it has been further afield I mean obviously Scotland um, from our personal point of view um, it ticks a lot of boxes for us in terms of the way that the game's played, uh, finances, uh, youthful players. Um, but what's been quite useful for this last couple of months is that we, as certainly the three people on the screen and um, obviously Rob Scott as well, we've managed to use the time really to to watch games and watch players even further afield. So, And it's actually become quite enjoyable to watch. We've watched Austrian, um, Danish, I think, uh, a lot of German um, well, some Spanish, a bit of French, I think. So, um, so we uh, we've got to we sort of got to think outside the box a little bit. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, Scotland, Ireland. Uh, obviously, we we brought Trev in uh, last year as well. Um, so they're they're definitely places that uh, that we're looking at constantly. And like I say, it, it, some of it suits the way that we play. So um, we, we'll we'll keep looking there. Just to keep the question rotation policy spinning, um, Martin Byrne says, can you see the championship becoming more competitive, i.e. closer point spread, and see it as a massive opportunity? Let's go for Hammy this time. Cool, cheers. Uh, it's going to be a difficult league. Look, I have, the championship, in my opinion, is the hardest league in European football. Um, and, I, and I know people say what quality is better in Premier League, and it is, but You've arguably got, I don't know, 20 teams in that division who think they've got a chance of getting in Premier League. And on any given Saturday, as you've seen many a times, certainly when we've been in it previously and, and even this season, any team's capable of beating anybody on any given day. Um, so the, the, the gap, um, it, it's, it's just, it's going to be tough, isn't it? Like, no matter what we, what we say on here, I think all fans know, we know, 
Um, everybody's a realist at the football club. They know it's going to be a tough ask to stay in championship. But we believe, um, and I'm sure that with decent performances on pitch, fans will start believing as they did last time. I, I honestly believe we're really unfortunate. And I know that you can go through um, certain matters, but there's definitely points we we um, messed up on last time we were in there, chances missed. And it's, it's like I said before, it's down to us to make players better so that next season when we go up there, that um, they take their opportunities, whether that's a clearance from a from a, um, a cross or a, an header from a set piece. or a, But we, we, we preach all the time about everything matters and it does. Uh, tackle, if you think about, like Gaffer spoke about, Accrington, Matt Ellison, there's clearance, Smudge's header against Shrewsbury. Like there's loads of little things you could go through. Dan Everson save at Sunderland. So it's down to us to make players be better at that key point and hopefully we can bridge that gap. I think just to elaborate on, on that question, I think the question has probably come about because the consensus at the minute is that obviously after the COVID-19 outbreak, it's going to be difficult for everyone financially. But, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, Richie, when you line up against, say, Fulham on the first day of next season, it's not going to be any easier than than it would have been otherwise, is it really? It's uh, it's perhaps a false, no. a false pretense, that. No, I, I can see why, um, why the view is out there that obviously things have got a little bit uh, more even um, but uh, you know that, that that's affected everybody so if everybody lowers their budget by 20% or 10% or whatever it is then you know it, it makes it a bit more of a level playing field uh, in terms of like everybody's had to cut the same same uh, same cloth so so I, I can see where people are coming from they suddenly now people think that uh, you know because there's a there's there's been a obviously the outbreak that we've had that all of a sudden now that everybody's going to, you know, start giving players away and, you know, that players are going to start signing for less amounts of money. That, that you know, it's, it's the league where everybody's chasing the promised land. Everybody wants to get promoted to the premiership and clubs will continue to gamble and continue to to pay wages and, and have budgets to, to try and get to where they want to get to. So um, I can see why people think it, but I, I think it's going to be equally as difficult, albeit hopefully we are better prepared. Um uh, the only thing I would say is that we could go six months between our last league game and our next league game. Six months is a hell of a long time. Uh, so, you know, we, we've got a lot of work to do and who knows. I was reading something the other day about people talking about form. Well, you know, they could just totally different players. You know, six months is a hell of a long time. So um, there's a lot of things we have to take into account. But I can see why people think that it's going to get a little bit easier. I'm not sure it is, though. In fairness, though, I, I, I understand why people think that and getting players in might be more difficult for the bigger clubs than usual. So some of the bigger clubs may have took a little bit of a hit. But most of the real established teams in the championship, their best players never get into the last uh, season of their contract. They've always got long contracts and that's still the case. So, if, for example, if Fulham don't go up this year, they, they won't be releasing 10 players who are out of contract. They'll virtually have the same you know, same team and, and they'll still want to sign some to improve or get Premier League loans in. So I still think it'll be a tough league and I think the step between the leagues is still massive. You can see now like Luton have won, what, three, drawn two, lost one in the last six games, of which all three of us have watched the last six Luton games and they've been brilliant in them games and they're still bottom. So them three teams now, is it Luton, Barnsley and Charlton, I think I'm right, they're the three that came up. So and they've had, and Charlton had an unbelievable start and they've now got themselves sucked into it. So I don't think any of us three are in any illusion that next year will be any easier. But I understand your point about recruiting. But I think if the clubs want to recruit, they can. Their owners will always find the money. Uh, slightly more light-hearted one from Brad Linney. Um, all three. What was your favourite goal score for the Millers this year? I know there was one. I can't remember it was against that you you sent us a clip and it was an unbelievable team goal that started. I'm going to throw in it, I think, in our sort of defensive third. But I'll, uh, I'll let you fire away. Ami, do you want to go first? Whatever is that, ever? Uh, this year, this year. Oh. Oh. Um, my my favourite one, and it is purely for personal reasons, is Ben Wilders against Bolton. Um, probably because I'm the one who's been kind of... Uh, believing what Wilders is capable of doing and to see it at stadium, for me... We just, I mean, it, look, we won't game comfortably anyway, but I think that got us back into it. They scored early, didn't they? And I think that will equalise a bit. From a personal, um, selfish point of view, it's, it, it was Wiles' goal for me. 
Yeah, Rich? Um, I was going to go Crooksy at Gillingham, but I've switched it to uh, Woody's against Ipswich at home when we won 1-0. Oh, um, what a goal that is. Yeah, but for, for, for reasons of... Um, uh, I think it was Crooksy's first game back since um, the unfortunately he was in his, his best friend and also uh, Jordan, his best mate, was also a friend of Woody's. So I think from an emotional point of view, for Woody to score and Crooksy um, to play in that game, uh, because I think it was it was pretty much after the Peterborough game, wasn't it? So, uh, so I am going to go for Woody's goal uh, because of what it meant for Woody and Crooksy. And Woody, finally, I've got two because I can't decide, and my memory, as these two will tell you, is horrendous. So I've done well to remember two. I like the one against. I think it was against Burton when Freddie scored the winner. It was a cross from Chio. Wilesy laid it off because I've got to mention Wilesy because Hammy's texting me saying I've got to keep mentioning Wilesy. So Wilesy laid it off and then Freddie smashed it in for a 3-2 win against a very good Burton team, by the way. So that felt like a massive win. But my other favourite was um, Dan Barlass's free kick against Blackpool because he hit it and where we are, because we've changed our dugout, we were right behind it and obviously watching him celebrate and how happy he was is just a joy. So he was just a great kid to have around. So for him to score a screaming winner like that uh, is Roy the Rover stuff. So from my point of view, I think that one. Just to uh, jump on the back of uh, Rich's answer there, um, it's not been asked, I'm just uh, carrying on the conversation, but I know you've had a lot to deal with emotionally between you this year, but Crooksy, I mean, they've all dealt with it really well, but Crooksy had to really play through it, didn't he? How pleased we and how proud of you what was it you of him? The fact they managed to keep his performance levels up when really he's he said we're probably all over the place. Uh, well, uh, yeah, well, it, it was um, obviously you look, think back to that particular Saturday when, when he received the phone call when we were playing Peter <laughs> away um, and, and what he's had to deal with for that. Um, just to go back and play was was massive for him, but to go back and play and and put in the performances that he's had because he quite, you know, he was, he was excellent up until that point. But it, it sort of could have derailed him a little bit. Um, in fairness, he used it as motivation, um, I think, to to put in the performances and try and obviously get the results that he wanted his best mate to um, uh, to obviously be a part of. So, so yeah, I think fair play to him because he, he you know, it could quite easily have he could have had. And, and, you know, I'm sure the manager would have given him as much. So he did give him as much time off, but he wanted to come back and play. I think the one thing that about football is it's a release. The one thing about when you go and play, when you cross that white line for 90 minutes, nothing else really matters to a certain extent. And uh, it's a good way for you to take away the issues that you have um, and and go and do something that you love doing. So, you know, he chose, in our opinion, the right way to go about it. Um, but I can see how sometimes people don't want to because they see that, you know, well, maybe it's too soon or maybe I'm being disrespectful. But, you know, he, in our opinion, he made the right decisions. It was right for him mentally. And um, obviously his performances were fitting of that towards the end, um, as it were all season. But, you know, like I say, it was um, it was brave from him and, uh, and, and mentally very strong. And, uh, you know, I, I'm sure he's done a lot of people very proud. A question from Bex29. It says for all of you, I assume it applies to players of all time, but particularly you two, Rich and Warney. What do you think it think makes Rotherham United so special for players and ex-players to come back and love the club so much? I know you two always kept a, a close eye on our uh, sort of progress after you'd left as well. You go in. Oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, no, uh, you, you have to ask them all individually. I, I, I can't answer for anybody else. I mean, for Rich, obviously, he, he lived here and... <laughs> It was an easier one. For me, but I'm a Norfolk boy, aren't I? My accent comes and goes, obviously. But uh, for I always remember Breck bringing me here from Wigan. And I always remember that I was always I always thought I was suited at a club where um, they just enjoyed, the fans just appreciated hard work. And that's probably why Hammy didn't play here, because he was too skillful. But um, So they just appreciated hard work. And even if I was absolutely honking, but I'd won three throw-ins, um, everyone still appreciated the effort you did. So I always felt a real connection to the fans here more than anybody else, anywhere else, sorry. I had a great time at Oldham. The Oval fans couldn't really work me out. They didn't understand why I didn't do step overs. 
never. Uh, and then I enjoyed coming back and Robbo brought me back. So I always had a good relationship here. And I always thought that, especially out of all the clubs I've played for, I thought the away following was always really good here. So, but I can't speak for all the players. Um, and in fairness, you ask every player, wherever you interview them, they'll always say, oh, my heart's at that club. You see people kissing their badges and that all the time, don't you? Don't trust everybody. But in fairness to uh, me and Rich, we've had a great time here and it'll always be, you know, a club that I definitely and my family, because my son's a massive Rotherham fan, uh, keep uh, firmly in my heart, as long as it continues, obviously. Before we let Rich jump in, um, did you uh, get the special Breck tour, Warney, when you signed? Because uh, I understand they used to... There was a specific driving route they took new signings to see all the uh, the wonderful sights of Rotherham. Did you come on that tour or, uh, or were you not that lucky? I've got so many jokes in my head. Uh, no, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't do that. I didn't do that drive with you, John. No, I had a week of, uh, I think it's well known, I had a week of playing different sports. I played basketball in uh, TRC College. We played rugby in the snow, uh, touch uh, football or some other crazy game. There was never any football. So I came for a week's trial and I was like Sport Billy. I came with my own badminton rackets and tennis rackets. So I got a deal on the back of that. So it was a perfect trial for me. Anything but football. And the lads, I thought, oh, he's a bit busy, isn't he? So I didn't get the uh, drive with John. No. Sounds very dubious, but no, I didn't get that. No. Did you, did you Rich? <laughs> no, because I already lived there, didn't you? Rich is from the uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I already lived there. So, um, and I couldn't afford to live in the nice areas at that particular time. So. Oh, what? So he, he, he took you through the picturesque routes, did he? Through Wentworth? Through Wentworth, yeah. All those type of places. Into, into Hamish territory. Oh, yeah. all the rich kids and all. All the detached houses. Yeah, no, I didn't get that, mate. I didn't get that. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll move on. A uh, question from George Hayes. Uh, for you, Warney, uh, who do you think was the hardest working player this season? Cool. It's a good question. It is a good question. I mean, on the on the distances and that, I think it, more often than not, it's probably Wilesy. Uh, but in fairness, it's hard to say that with our teams. Like, if you'd ask me who was the best on the ball or who, I don't know, made the most chances or something, it's a bit more definitive. But I wouldn't say that anyone. Uh, Matt Olasundi covered no end of ground. Uh, Michael Ickwe did for centre-half, to be fair. Chio was unbelievable. Um Jamie Lindsay, when he played, worked his absolute socks off. I, it's never ended, to be honest. I, that's a question I can't answer. The two strikers who ever played worked really hard. If not, they wouldn't play. So my, I probably would say, um, I would probably say one of the two midfielders, really, Wilesy or, or Jamie Lindsay, possibly, or Crooksy. But in fairness, they cover a lot of distance at 70%. The one player, I think, who was phenomenal was Chio. Because virtually everything he'd done was flat out. And for anyone who does any athletics would realise that, you know, you run 40 metres flat out with the ball at your feet and you are blowing. Then you've got us three shouting at you to run back and then to run forward and to run back. So although he probably didn't cover the most distance, I think he suffered the most physical pain. So uh, it's hard to, you know, if you put a gun to me, Ed, I'd say Chio. But I reckon the other two would probably agree with me. It's, it's a difficult question to answer that. Yeah. Um... Question from John Davis. He says, hello from Luxembourg. So people are listening. Uh, firstly, congratulations and thank you for putting a smile on all our faces. Uh, we'll go for Richie for this one. One for Richie. How he big is Luxembourg, Rich. He's fluent in Luxembourg. <laughs> very this, this watch in that watch it. Yeah. He's been doing languages. You won't believe him on this. In this lockdown, that's what he's been doing. <laughs> Come on, Rich. What's the chances? I translated that question. Go on, then. What's the question? Sorry. So the question is, how big a squad do we need next season and why? Um, yeah, good question, because I think, uh, firstly, the obvious answer is we have got um, a, a very tough season, a very tough period in, in a shorter period of time. So, you know, we're, we've not been confirmed yet in terms of when the, the start date is, but it's clearly not going to be on the same days when it normally is at the beginning of August. So it could be anything from the end of August to the beginning uh, so the middle of September. So that automatically means more midweek games. Um, I think it's been mentioned anything up to 12 or 13, I think, midweek games. And then you obviously throw in cup competitions. Um, so it is going to be a test. I mean, the, the championship's a test anyway, going back to what we were talking about a little bit earlier about maybe one thing that we may have learned last time was the, the physicality and what it takes out of you playing in the championship. And when you play Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, looking back now, there was often maybe 
if 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 we played the same team three teams three times in a week, there was probably a little bit of a drop off towards the third game in terms of distance covered and high intensity running. So, um, so maybe maybe that you know we need to look at or we have spoken about freshening things up in the third game in a week. Um, and clearly for that to happen, you need a strong squad. You need to be able to maybe rotate the strikers, rotate the wide players. Um, but that, that's everybody because, you know, going back to the question before that one was who works the hardest. If you don't work hard, you don't play. So that's why I think you find it so difficult uh, to answer the question in terms of an individual. Um, but maybe, maybe, we, I know the manager doesn't like having a very big squad because he's not like um, disappointing people, but maybe we probably need one or two players more than we normally would due to the number of midweek games and due to the fact of, you know, it's obviously a sort of condensed, probably slightly, you know, maybe a month less in terms of the season. So less recovery, uh, like I said, more games. Um, and obviously that means more injuries. You'd be amazed in professional football how many how many injuries there are that between three and five days. And obviously, you know, that means that if there's, if there's three games in a week, that means you probably end up nearly missing all of them. So, um, you know, the, the, we, it just so happened, I think, quite a few times this year that we'd have three or four of those players all at the same time missing for a midweek game. And we've got to try and make sure that doesn't happen this season. Um, question from uh, we'll Kevin Goldsmith. I'll say uh, thank you in Luxembourgish, which is mercy, by the way. Yeah, Richard. Well, Googled. Well, Google. I, Google, yeah, I just went to the back of my brain. I remember doing it in high school. I remember doing it in high school. Sorry, well, go on, go. question. Um, question from, I think, one of your old friends, Warney, uh, Kevin Goldsmith. Could you ask PW if he thinks his early days have been coached with the use of the Sabutio pitch, old tobacco tin and bottle tops has influenced the way he coaches his players today at all? Yeah, yeah Goldie, Goldie's <laughs> top man. Top man. It's, you've got to keep it simple in here. So my old uh, non-league coach... still brings him to so training now. I mean, the only thing was, I mean, we, he used to bring out this green felt, like snooker table felt, with a pitch on, and then he'd put bottle top. So he's good for visual learners, Rich, isn't he, to be fair? Audio learners. Ahead of his fair. time. Ahead of his time. Yeah, exactly. Although when he used to tell you what you had to do, he was very Scottish. He used to like F and Jeff at you a bit, but he got the point. It, it, it stuck in your head. If you didn't shoot far post, he's going to knock you out. So, um, and he'd use this bottle top. And you'd always think, well, what am I going to be this week? Am I Amstel? Am I Budweiser? What am I? So, uh, yeah, he was good, Punty. Obviously, Goldie, you're watching this. Uh, Punty was top man. And in fairness, um, um, well, I'd say that, yeah, he had an effect on me, but I never thought I wanted to be in coaching. So I wouldn't have said he had that much of an effect on me. But um, he was good how he organised the teams and how everyone knew what they had to do, I think. And he simplified it. And in fairness, like all three of us on this screen, simplify it as best we can because it's just easier for the lads to retain the knowledge. So, uh, yeah. If that answers your question. You could have just uh, told me that, though, and I'd have told you that. <laughs> Another question from Kate, in, uh, one that I think you've, you've sort of found the winning formula to, but an interesting one nonetheless. Are we ever going to own our own goalkeeper, or are you just happy to have them on loan? Uh, Hammy, do you want to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Well, um, it's worked so far, hasn't it? Um, I, I, think, I think it's... it's. I mean, what, what do you... I know what you mean by owning your own keeper. But like if we've had Marek Rodak for a two-year contract, um, we've had Dan for a year, and Marek's arguably now one of the best keepers in championship. Now, could we potentially bring somebody in on a permanent of that basis? Look, we're always looking. Um, however, it's really, really difficult. So um, and what you also find now, certainly from Premier League and top clubs, is they, they just keep more and more keepers. Um for, for numerous reasons, really, and not because they're going to play them, but for training keepers under 23s games, um, they might take an international from a European country just, just because they've shown some potential. So, look, in an ideal world, we'd like every player to be contracted to Rotherham United, 100% we would. However, we, we're well aware um, that if we might have to bring a player in who makes us better, um, and financially, it's, it's more viable. And certainly, I think if you look at track record with keepers for the last three years, it's, it's certainly worked. Um, if, we, if we could have signed Marek or Dan, would we? 100%. I think we'd all agree with that. But unfortunately, the money and, the, well, I'm saying they probably wouldn't even sell him. Fulham wouldn't have sold Marek, definitely. And, and Leicester wouldn't sell Dan. So, but if they come available and was, if the price were right for us to buy, then I, certainly we, we would we have definitely brought one of them too. Yeah. In fairness as well, like in fairness to that question as well, like 
like Pricey's uh, been here a few years now and his training attitude and everything's unbelievable. And he's helped both Marek and Dan significantly. So although um, Pricey hasn't had the same amount of minutes on the pitch, his influence in the dressing room and on the goalkeepers and the goalie coach and everything is pretty uh, massive. So uh, I appreciate you always see a lone goalkeeper. But in fairness, if they sign a season-long loan, like I know Rich is going to say, it's no different than signing a, a year's contract anyway. So Marek, like you could have just looked at Marek and signed a two-year deal. I mean, we didn't sell him at the end, but we still had use of him um, at a lot less cost as well, to be fair. A question from Dean for uh, you, Rich and Warney. Um, can you pick out the best Rotherham player you both played with, maybe in the promotion years 2001, etc.? Congratulations to all on a brilliant season. Mine's easy. I'll do mine very quick. Stuart Talbot. Easily the best player I've ever played with. Not technically, it's not about technical for me. Roy Keane wasn't the best technical player, although Rich would tell you he was up there. But um, uh, he wasn't the best technical player at all, but he was just a leader on the pitch, in the dressing room, in the tunnel, good with the lads, picked the lads up, argued with the manager if the manager was out of order, stuck up for the lads. Just literally, if you want to go to battle, you go in with Stuart Talbot. I, when, when he left, I never thought he got replaced. And if I could sign a Stuart Tall, but I wouldn't sign him now. He looks horrendous. But uh, he was definitely the best player I played with. And you um, yeah, well, I mean, I, I agree in terms of Tolms. Uh, fantastic captain, great leader. Uh, definitely, for me, a Rotherham United player. But just in terms of out-and-out out ability, who could have gone as far as he wanted to, was Al. Um, and in terms of did I play with him that often? No, I normally, I, I normally came on a sub for him or something when he was getting a bit tired. But... Um, I would also put him in that didn't fulfil his potential because he had everything. You know, six foot three, probably a bit like Smudge, really. Six foot three, could run, could score goals, worked hard. Um, maybe if he'd have kept his feet out of the pub a few more times, he probably may have fulfilled his potential a little bit more. But I think Al was the one player that could have easily gone and been anything he wanted to be. Um, question for anyone that wants to take it from Ben Ramskill. What was the best individual performance from a player this year, both for us and for the opposition? So, just one of you wants to have a go at that one. I mean, uh, I'd probably say for the opposition, I thought that um, Reese Healy against MK Dons were very good at our place. Uh, for us, oh, as an individual performance, Cool. There's an absolute number. Well, Crooksy Ipswich was good. Crooksy yeah. Ipswich was right up there. Balls. I remember Chio against Bristol Rovers, I think, probably a game that nobody remembers that well. But he absolutely rinsed fullback numerous occasions. Obviously at home, I presume. Yeah, at home, yeah. yeah. Um, so them two, probably. Quick, easy answer. Yeah. Can I just say on that, I think Michael Ickwe was every week in terms of, an, it, it, it was hard to say that he was excellent because he was that good every week for me. Icky was that good in pre-season, wasn't he? We, he never put a foot wrong in pre-season in any yeah. game where we're thinking, oh my God, Icky's going to have some season this year. And then we, we got him in a full Nelson in the gym, made him sign a new deal. Um, I mean, it, what was he thinking? I mean, I'm only joking. Um, he's done well to sign a new deal, but we were buzzing he signed a new deal and he went on to, I completely agree with Rich. If someone said to me the best player this year, who could you not live without? Um, after my wife, I would say uh, Icky. Oh, actually, before my wife. I mean, she'll appreciate it. She knows it. <laughs> question from uh, Will Daniels to you, Warnick. Uh, it's a double-ended double, it's a double -ended question. Ooh. First part is, um, how invaluable will a fully fit Sean McDonald or can be in uh, next season's championship, given his experience? Yeah. And the second half of the question is, and it's a good one to all coaches, um, are you doing anything in terms of trying to get the lads ready to deal potentially with football without crowds or is that something you look at further down the line? OK, first part, uh, Shawnee Mack will be invaluable, definitely. I mean, in fairness, I don't know the people who are watching this, if you went to the Donny away game, we played really well up until Shawnee came off and then he had a few um, uh, physical problems, so to speak. Uh, but he will be essential. I think if you heard my talk to the lads the other week, last week, as I mentioned him and Woody. Uh, we went through the team today, thinking all the ones with experience, but especially when we need a sitter, um, he'll be in, like, imperative to our success, really. So definitely that and the fact that he is an unbelievable lad uh, and he encourages the young lads and speaks to all the young pros and all that, and people don't see that. 
I think he's helped Walsy no end, the way he speaks to Walsy and Jamie Lindsay no end. So definitely a massive part of us next year. Um, he has to get in the team like they all do. But um, yeah, he'll definitely play a, a big part, I think. Uh, the second part of the question uh, was, oh, crowd, sorry, my memory's horrendous. Um, well, luckily we train where the, we don't have 10,000 people. So it shouldn't be hard to replicate playing in front of nobody. I say nobody. Uh, uh, our mates on the gate every day but um, um, so I don't think it's going to be that difficult I think unbelievably in the championship we were brilliant at home we struggled away from home and it was a massive advantage and I think you see in uh, the German league now they haven't got crowds the home form isn't what it was um, you know there isn't an advantage to be had so that will probably help us on our travels in the champ but then we don't get the advantage at home so until we actually excuse me until we actually play in it I don't know but for us to replicate silence at the training ground will be very easy for us. Um, a question that says for all three, but it's definitely one for Ami. Um, ben Wiles has played in a number of positions this season, centre mid, left back, wing, number 10. What is his best position, in your opinion, and how far do you think he can go? I know you, you'll say he can win the World he Cup. Can he can play anywhere. Yeah, that's amazing. coming in, but go on, Ami. Goalkeeper, yeah. no, goalie. Uh, yeah, not be a bad goal either, to be fair. Oh, be good. Cricket roots, weren't it? Up, 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 like, yeah. um, oh, don't get I, I about cricket. I think his, his best position is uh, as a central midfield player. But I, I think that um, he needs to get a little bit more experience of playing in there. Um, I think like what you just said about him playing in different positions is, is not easy at all. And the fact that... Um, at times he's been his best left back. At times he's been his left best left winger, his best right winger. Speaks volumes about him as a as a young player, um, and and I'm sure we'll all agree on screen that he's not even really probably fulfilled his potential yet. Um, but that's going to be down to him, you know. He's, he's not going to have a god given right to get in team. Um, he, he's got to, got to earn it. But I certainly think as a central midfield player, that, that in my opinion, that's his best position. Um, so again, to anyone that wants to take it from Miller Exo, uh, which away game would you say that our fans helped the team the most? Was the one where they were particularly vocal and you thought it, it helped turn the tide? Well, I think for me, Lincoln, I'd probably Lincoln. go Lincoln. Lincoln. Yeah. I, I just yeah. that, that that night for some reason. Um, I think you we drinking is what it is. Yeah, yeah. We went well. We went for a walk up to um, Cathedral, didn't we? Which was yeah. a very nice afternoon. But even when me and Rich, we obviously go out earlier for warm up. Um, it was just bouncing, weren't it? Atmosphere was just like really good, and all the way through the game, it was just you, all you could hear were our fans. You couldn't, you wouldn't have thought it was yeah. Lincoln's ground, and usually Lincoln's really intimidating place to go. So. We've all played there and usually they're really good at home, the fans, but I just thought our fans that night were, were brilliant. I would, even, I would even say the FA Cup game where we were 3-0 down, just to make it exciting. I don't know if everyone was so worried. Um, I thought the fans were there were good because I spoke to the lads after and normally the lads would say like, you know, God, get dogs abuse or, you know, you've got to take a throw in and people are going, what are you doing and all that. But that wasn't the case. And I don't think, for, I don't think, and I've said it loads of times, fans are unbelievably powerful. Unbelievable. If you go and take a corner and someone tells you you're rubbish, the chance of you hitting it bang on the button, very slim. If someone tells you you're great, come on, you know, give it, give it everything and you're just wired. Oddly enough, you're better. There's no surprise in that. So I think fans play a massive part. I think, I even thought they were uh, really good on Boxing Day. Boxing Day games are good and Friday night games are ledge. I would love to play more Friday night games. We should have a couple of our home games this year on a Friday night. It'd be legend. Well, not when there's no crowd. It'd be pretty pretty pointless uh, until the crowds come in. But um, yeah, I agree with Amy. Uh, there's a few questions coming to this effect, but it's about um, obviously the heartache that's been in the squad for a number of people this year. And it has been a really tough year for so many reasons. People are asking, do you think it, it genuinely gave us that extra motivation to try and push for prom promotion? Um, no and yes really I think the lads are always motivated at the start of the season they're always a close group you know we do loads of different things with them and ask them loads of different questions they put on presentations so they're always a close group uh, and we and the lads will just you know testify to this but I harp on to them all the time about how short life is and that um, and how short careers are and how I'm harping on at you now with 10 months to go and before you know it the season's gone again that's one more 
you've done and one less you can look forward to. So I think they're always a close group and they're quite emotionally connected, I think. However, when you go through loss and you have all your people around you supporting you, it's a big deal. I still remember Jamie Lindsay when his son was really poorly and they won their Christmas due and, and Shawnee Mack got a train from London all the way uh, up to Scotland with him. Uh, and then I don't know if he got a taxi back to his house in Manchester or something. And I thought, I thought then like they're a really close group. I and mean, if they win or lose, like abuse me, that's fine. Don't abuse my coaches or my players. Abuse me, that's absolutely fine. But don't abuse the lads for their work ethic and how close they are and, and how hard they wanted to win. And then obviously is the year when we had more and more bad news. And I thought the lads were all there for each other. You know, in the same way, Rich um, sort of mentored Crooksy a bit at the end. Crooksy only really wants to speak to Rich because you know, it was pretty raw for both of them. So um, it, it it probably brought them not closer, but as close. But I thought that, you know, uh, their performances throughout the season, although we struggled at home early on because teams just sat behind the ball and we just couldn't break them down. Apart from that, I thought we were always quite good and they were always close, always together. And like we see them on a daily basis, but it might have helped them. Uh, I know Crooksy was the one who was devastated we didn't come back. He kept texting me and seeing me at the training ground saying, look, we need to finish the season gaffer. He was well revved up for it. But um, I, I, the other two can answer. I don't know if it brought them closer. I thought they were close anyway. Yeah, just uh, I, they're a fantastic group of people who I think recognise that, you know, we, we used it quite a lot, unfortunately. But when one of us was hurting, everybody was hurting. And I think, um, you know, obviously we, we, we've we've been a part of that. Where, but they are a, a, an amazing group of people that, um, you know, I agree really. It's a sort of yes and no in terms of, like, I think, I think that every time one of us went through a problem, um, that everybody else is always there for you. But I, I think, genuinely, I think we'd have, we'd have finished in the top two, obviously, anyway, because I think, um, the way that they all pulled together, um, and they were literally right from day one in pre season, and the meetings that were had in pre season were excellent. Um, and, and I think one defining moment, as has just been said, is for one player to get on a train with another player from London to Scotland to be with him to make sure that he's not on his own to go and find his little baby in hospital at the other end um, and spend the evening there and then come back on his own, I, I think speaks volumes, uh, particularly for somebody, and it shouldn't really mean this, but he plays in the same position as him. He was playing instead of him. You know, so it, I think that um, speaks volumes about Sean McDonald, but I think it also speaks volumes about the people that we have at the football club. Uh, there's been, again, a, a couple of questions to this effect, and it's to do with the style and sort of the approach. This year, it's been very much a, right, we'll come out and attack you, we'll score one more new type. Do you have to temper that a little bit in the championship? Someone's mentioned, obviously, a, the away record last time we were in there. Do you, do you think we'll um, change the style at all, or is it, more confidence in, in the personnel that we've got going forward now. Uh, I'll just go. Look, game management is obviously a big part in the championship. You know, when when we were you know beating Coventry four 0 and Peterborough four uh, nil, Bolton six one was it? And, and you know we had three or four five nilers I think the year before in League One as well. Um, I think one game that stands out for me in the championship a couple of years ago was Stoke. I think we were winning 2-0 at home and they brought on Bojan, Crouch and Darren Fletcher, I think, three Champions League winners' medals, I think they are. Um, I think there's a recognition of in the championship that being 2-0 up with 15 minutes to go isn't probably quite the same as being 2-0 up, uh, you know, stating the obvious, in League One with 15 minutes to go. Because in the championship, you can, you know, they can score three goals as quickly as they want. Three goals in five minutes, you get three shots... You know, they all hit the target. There's every chance one or two of them could go in. So so I think one thing that we may have to just look at a little bit is, and I think he's massively improved over the last two, two, two and a half years uh, since since we all came in, Was is the game management aspect of it. Is that actually if we're winning 2-0 or 2-1 with 10, 15 minutes to go, uh, it's about seeing the game out and ensuring that we don't give, um, you know, simple opportunities to, to good players, really. So... Um, whereas I thought there was times in League One this year, particularly like you say the Coventrys and the Boltons and the, you know, the games we won fairly. Uh, Bristol Rovers, I think, were three 0 up after an hour or something. You sort of get the impression that the lads can see that through. It's a little bit different in the Championship, so I, I'm sure we will continue to try and score goals. We'll continue to create as many chances as possible. We just have to be a little bit more aware of those half chances 
uh, in the championship. Free kicks in and around the box, set plays, things like that. They can quite easily change a 1 0 into a 2 1. And um, we'll just go for two more questions. We've just about got time for that. Um, one from Joel How happy does it make you to feel as coaches to see Shemi Ajayi progress as a player? You know, and you guys are the people who gave him a chance. I suppose that applies to more than just Shemi as well, but uh, whoever wants to step up and say that one. Yeah, I'll quickly say about Shem. I texted him the other day because he played at Old Trafford, didn't he? So uh, great for Shem. Great bloke. His dad's a good bloke as well. So, And it's the same for any of ours. Like I said, right at the start, I think one of my first questions was about Dan, Dan Barlasser. If he goes on and plays for Newcastle and was a regular in the first team, he's on match of the day every Saturday night, we will be buzzing. For us personally, it would, it would help us out if he didn't and he came and played for us, but we're not you know, we're not selfish people. You know, we want our players to enjoy their time under us, go on and be bigger and better and um, remember us when we want an FA Cup ticket. So that's sort of um, how I see it. Tammy? No, I 100% agree. And look, I think sometimes problem is, is when like, um, obviously Shemi and Will have probably been our most too successful as people see it because they've gone on to bigger and better things. But... For example, like Akeem Mines went to Lincoln and we've, we've all got as much immense pride in Akeem doing that as we did do with Shemi J going and playing for West Brom. So it's not just like the, the bigger it is, it's, it's all our players really. We just want them to be the best they can be and whatever level that, that aspires to, if it means that they have a career in game or whatever, that's that's like, it fills us all with immense pride really. Um, had, a, had a keen played against us with Lincoln Um I think it had been difficult for quite a lot of us, really, because uh, we, all, we all really liked him as a lad, but we like all our players. So, And we've, we've had numerous... I think Ryan Manning come on loan, didn't he, when we were in Champion, gone back and got in QPR team, done exceptionally well. Um, Zach Viner did really well for us and then went up to Scotland and has done well up there. So there's been a number of players, really, but we, we all keep an eye out on all of them, really, and we're all in contact with them regularly, aren't we? So yeah. I, I think mean, it, fairness, that's I'd... something that... Oh, sorry. In fairness, like the players that who leave, you know, when players leave the club and like sometimes the fans are like, oh, God, Joe knew I did he not sign and all that. We don't see it like that because we were players. So we understand that in fairness to Joe Newell, you'd be surprised to know, he comes from Birmingham, he's not a Rotherham United fan. So he's entitled to take his boots wherever he wants to for his family and for him, not for, you know, people watching this. I don't sound awful, but... I've had a text off Joe Newell today. It was his first day back in training. He said he struggled with his face mask. So obviously I did a joke about, especially with his breath. Um, we spoke to John Taylor in the last seven days, haven't we? Because he's text. Spoke to Willow. Spoke to Fordy. Um, so all these players that we have, we are like emotionally like connected to all of them. And I can, I can speak for all three of us here. We absolutely idolise our lads. And if they go on to great things, great. And if they go on and fall through the leagues, the same thing. I texted Darnell Fisher the other day, wishing him the best for the end of season push. So we've kept in contact with everyone because that's who we are. Now, whether that's right or wrong, and it's better to be a manager or a coach who once they leave the building, that's it. And that's not who we are. We're, we're emotionally connected to all our players. Hence, I think they work so hard for us because they want to do well for us. Um, but we want them to do well for themselves and to go on to greater things. I can't believe there hasn't been one question about how many bids we've had in for any of our players, which is quite good. And if there's only one question left, uh, you're a brave man if you ask me that now. So what is your last question, Sam? Uh, no, I, I think oh. everyone, everyone's starting to say thanks for thanks for joining us. Thanks for your time. Thanks for getting us promoted. Everything along them lines. Anything you, you guys want to say before you leave? Uh, I'll go first. Just that um, I apologise for Saturday night's debacle. I've come out of the sunshine for this. And anyone who knows me, for me to sit in the shade when the sun's out, it's a big deal. But thanks ever so much for your support. I hope you're happy and healthy. I hope you enjoy your summer. I hope you enjoy following everything on Twitter. I think Sam's done an amazing job, not just because he's on here, but by what he's been trying to put on all through the summer, uh, all through these months when we've been off. So thanks to Sam and please keep supporting him any way you can. Um, I'd obviously like to thank the chairman because he supports us. We, he's never said no to anything I've asked for. I haven't asked for Ronaldo before you asked that question, but he's always been really supportive, as has Rob uh, working with the recruitment team, although us three have been watching more games than I care to uh, mention. But sincerely, thanks. I hope you enjoy the season next year, next season, and but be prepared. It will be tough. And please, if you're sitting beside someone who wants to abuse the team, uh, stick your hand up, get a steward and get them out because they're no good to us. You want people who are right behind the team, 
no matter what. And it's easy to support the team that are winning every week, uh, but the teams who, who really need it are us. So we will need everybody, players, coaches, physios, everyone next year pulling together to try and have an amazing season. So um, on behalf of me, uh, thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, I wasn't aware that we had a special deal with Nike. Next time I'll wear that top, but um, that's me done. So thank you. Well, thanks again for joining us, gents. Really. Well, them two, them two not oh, saying goodbye. Why can't on. they say goodbye? Oh, they can say goodbye. We're on yeah, one of well, I'll do it very, very briefly. We're not on a meet, Mark. Okay. We're actually on a meet. <laughs> yeah. my internet. Thanks. Thanks for having us, Simon. Well done for sorting your internet out. It was excellent. And um, oh. just to reiterate that, um, obviously difficult times. Try and stay safe. And um, we will look forward to hopefully getting some kind of crowd back into New York Stadium as quickly as possible and as safely as possible. But I'm aware that it might not be as easy as it looks. But um, hopefully we will get uh, some spectators in and some fans in as quickly as possible. But in the meantime... Stay safe, and you're obviously going to have to stand behind me and have me in the night shop queue. Matthew, we don't get the discount, uh, do we? Lastly, for me, thanks obviously to these fellas on screen, but all other members of staff who we've got. I think sometimes me um, our medical team don't probably get as much recognition as, as they get. Uh, recruitment team, everybody at club, like Gaff has just touched upon, board of directors, chairman. But I think one club thing um, that sets this club aside is when times get tough, everybody sticks together. And I think that certainly this week, a um, number of people I, I bumped into area have had a smile on the face because of promotion from lads. So um, I hope we've we've entertained you all. We've, we've kept a smile on your face. I know it's been tough for you all out there. And that's why we've been doing these quizzes and stuff. Um, but thanks again for all your support. support. And um, make sure you come out again next year and really get behind lads like Gaffer said. It doesn't half make a difference. Um, and we, we hope that when we do resume, that you can all come down and, and, and watch lads and really get behind them again. And I'll just finish by saying thank you on behalf of everyone, on behalf of myself. Thank you for doing the quizzes every week, trying to you know, keep smiles on faces. And not only that, but getting us promoted as well as a, as a Rodham fan myself. We are. Oh, don't get emotional, Sam. Come on, I'm going to come and see you in the office. We can yeah, have a, uh, a three-meter hug. Thank you for joining <laughs> us tonight, and uh, I will let you go now. Don't Cheers, you know, pump it up. Reds are going up. Doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs>